Hey all, it's me, Two Sheds, and today I have a new kind of video for you. Today, we're talking about King Charles VI, or as you probably know him, the Mad King of France. The man whose reign not only gave him complete humiliation, but also screwed over his desperate nation. Hey, that rhymes. Now, you might be thinking, man, he must have had some horrible luck. But no. He was the architect of his own demise. How did that come to be? Let's find out. So Charles was brought into this world in Paris, France, by his father, King Charles V, and his mother, Queen Joanna of Bourbon, on December 3rd, 1368 which is exactly 640 years before my pal Goofer Trooper. Please subscribe to him, by the way. His videos are awesome. Anyway, he was part of the Valois family, a sub-branch of the Capet family, which was arguably the most powerful family in human history, including the extended branches. He was also the king and queen's first kid, and because of how most lines of successions work, he was first in line to take his dad's job when the time came. When he was born, he was called the Dauphin. No, not that kind of dolphin. That kind of dolphin. He was also accompanied by a brother called Louis, of course a French king would name his kid that, and a sister, Catherine. Also a possible half-sibling from a suspected affair from his father, but that's another story. So unfortunately for Charles, he probably didn't have the happiest childhood. His dad was usually off fighting in the Hundred Years' War and also feuding with Pope Gregory XI, so he didn't exactly have much time to play catch with his son. His mom, on the other hand, well, at least she seemed to start out as a decent mom, but then around the time of her second kid's birth, she went totally bonkers, which explains a lot. And then she died around the time Charles would have been in third grade in the modern education system. And speaking of his parents dying while he was young, so Charles V went to join Queen Joanna in the good place due to abscess on September 16, 1380. This put the young Dauphin Charles, now known as Charles VI, in charge. The only problem besides, we'll get to that, was that at the time you had to be 14 years old to have any real power. So his uncles did his job for him until he was 20. Unfortunately for everyone though, to put it nicely, these uncles were not as selfless as the late Charles V. And by that, I mean they reversed his final dying decision for their own personal gain. One of them, in fact, Philip the Bold, even raided the county of Flanders just because he thought that they would make him a count there. He wasn't made one there, by the way. But our friend Charles himself was having probably the best years of his life. His happiest day was likely July 17, 1385, because that was the day he and Isabeau of Bavaria got married. The two of them stayed together in holy matrimony for as long as they both lived and had 12 children together, some of whom being much more notable than others. In 1388, after finally getting his life back on track, Charles finally decided to take on the job of king for himself. He was even able to get most of the people who worked for his dad back in power. He was at the high point of his life, and even the common folk knew it. They even gave him the name of Charles the Beloved. But you know what they say, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. So, as you might remember, Charles' mother suffered from mental health problems later in life, more specifically psychosis. 
And unfortunately for us all, especially for him, after a prosperous few years of reign with real power, the condition proved to be hereditary. It only took a little push to really send him down a never-ending spiral. That push came in 1392, when his friend and colleague, Oliver de Cleason, was nearly assassinated by a disgruntled aristocrat. When Charles found out about this, he was naturally furious and wanted the culprit punished. The only problem was he was hiding in Brittany and Duke John V, a highly respected figure at the time, refused to hand him over. This triggered him. In a manner I can only imagine similar to Chris Chan in Ye Olden YouTube, he gave a very long, angry speech and set off to Brittany with his army. Along the way, a soldier accidentally clanged some metal pieces together, which, you know, it happens, but Charles, he thought he was being ambushed by the guy and killed him, and even a few others trying to stop him. Yes, all of this over one guy. From that incident on, it only got worse. He often forgot who he was and even who his wife and kids were, and at one point even went through a phase where he thought he was St. George and would aimlessly run through the castles and rarely ever even so much as change his royal outfit. Remind you of someone? But of course, his most memorable trait of all, glass delusion. If you don't know what it is, it's exactly what it sounds like. As reported in a manuscript later on by Pope Pius II, he thought, honest to goodness, that his body was made of glass and would shatter if anyone touched it. To combat this, he would usually wear a bunch of metal under his clothes. Gee, I wonder what he thought about the film that M. Night Shyamalan released in 2019. So yeah, he was a bit paranoid. Only a select few people could be consistently trusted by him, such as Pierre Salmon, who was known among his staff as the one person who could break through his madness from time to time. Sheesh, if only you were around now, a psychiatrist could learn a thing or two from him. So before we get into his actual actions as king, I have one more little story I wanted to tell you. An event known as the Ball de Ardennes. So, on January 29th, 1393, Charles' wife Isabeau's friend was getting married. So, she wanted to throw a little party for her. And well, as you can guess from the tone of this video so far, it went pretty disastrously. Charles thought it would be a good idea to have people with live torches. So, after a bit of dancing, his brother Louis arrived fashionably late and ended up accidentally messing with one of the torches. As a result, the place and even some of the dancers literally burned down as he and Isabeau just sat along and watched. So next time your plans go wrong, remember you're not this guy at least. Now imagine what would happen if his plans did actually go right. Oh wait, we don't have to wonder. We actually know. They went like this. Now, some of you might be thinking, Two Sheds, that's not very nice of you, making fun of someone who's clearly not all there. Now, sure, some of you have a point there. So allow me to take away any sense of sympathy from him, which he most certainly lost on September 17th, 1394. Now... As I'm sure you realize by now, anti-Semitism is generally considered by most of us reasonable people to be a pretty bad thing. But we're not exactly dealing with a reasonable guy here, are we? Now, Charles VI, if you couldn't guess from the whole St. George thing I mentioned earlier, was a pretty deep Christian. Now, he and also to some extent his wife were some of those fanatics who believed that everybody should have their religion forced on them or else. Yeah, these are the kind of people that make me unashamed to be an atheist. Despite how red it makes us look sometimes. But 
let's get back on track. So a decent amount of the population of France at the time was Jewish, and France had kind of flip-flopped over whether or not they took kindly to that over the years. Charles was decidedly on the not-okay side of things. So what's our hero? Nah, that's a stretch. What's our person of the day to do? Kick them off their land in what was once the only place to easily practice their religion within a reasonable distance. What the heck, dude? What, would a multi-religious state shatter your ego? She stuff like this makes me kind of glad he wasn't always the one making the decisions. Speaking of... So who was in charge when Charles was not well? Usually his wife Isabeau, who, credit where it's due, clearly put up with a lot, but at least she was always by her husband's side. At first, she would usually seek influence from Philip the Bold, you know, the uncle who invaded Flanders when Charles was young, but would gradually turn more towards his brother Louis for... reasons. Okay, maybe take back what I said about her always being by his side. Philip was disappointed, but after he died in 1404, his son John the Fearless rose to power. And, well, things didn't really go so great from there. So while Philip put up with the whole getting forced out of power due to personal bias thing, John was determined to get revenge. So he started a civil war that lasted even beyond Charles' own lifetime and even resulted in his brother's assassination. Look how they mess with my bro. So yeah, Charles let his own country shatter as he feared he might one day himself. Fitting. So you may be wondering, Two Sheds, this doesn't have anything to do with the sea dog. Why are you focusing on this? Well, let me ask you something. Wouldn't it be a shame if you were being weakened by an internal civil war while already in a conflict with an even greater rival? Sure would, wouldn't it? As you know, we've inherited quite a war to crunch from King Charles V. How bad is it, Secretary Van Houten? So yeah, as mentioned before, Charles's father spent his entire reign fighting the Hundred Years' War which our Charles then inherited. Now by that point, a majority of French land had been reclaimed. So first, Charles wanted to extend the olive branch. So if you didn't know, the war started because the mainline Capet family ran out of eligible people to be the king of France. And thus, the Valois family, the next closest sub-branch, succeeded them. The problem came when England's Plantagenet family thought that they had a better claim. They feuded for over a century over that. Now, since Charles was already winning when he got in, he wanted to extend the olive branch by having his daughter marry England's King Richard II as a way to kind of unite the families. As a side note, she was 7 and he was 29 on their wedding day. Bruh. This marriage, however, didn't last long. For reasons unrelated to the war, Richard was forced to abdicate the throne by the Lancasters and then died in prison less than a year later. This is where Charles' nemesis comes into the picture, King Henry V. Now, Henry wanted Charles' job even more than his Plantagenet cousins. Knowing that France was weakened by a civil war, he re-escalated the war after it had been relatively non-violent for the last few decades. This came to a head on October 25th, 1415 in Agincourt, where Henry and his commanders easily defeated five of Charles's best strategists. By May of 1420, approaching a full four decades as king, Charles sunk to a new low yet when he signed the Treaty of Troyes, which designated Henry V as his eventual successor over his own son. 
And worse yet, Henry basically ruled France and Charles's place while he was relegated to whatever castle they wanted to hold him in on any given day. And on top of that, Henry even married his daughter, Catherine of Valois, making the two mortal enemies father-in-law and son-in-law, and her the Queen of England. If I had a nickel for every time one of this guy's daughters became the Queen of England, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Sadly for Henry, he wouldn't get to inherit the French throne as planned, as he died unexpectedly at the peak of his success on August 31st, 1422. He was succeeded as the King of England by his only baby son and Charles's baby grandson, King Henry VI. He also succeeded him as Charles's new supposed heir apparent. He didn't know that particular title long as, on October 21st, 1422, just weeks after Henry's death, Charles himself died peacefully of natural causes. In other words, he finally shattered. But wouldn't you know it, even in death, he caused grief to all around him. You see, the Treaty of Troyes was pretty controversial, and a lot of the French aristocracy refused to follow it through. They quickly declared Charles's only surviving son to be King Charles VII. The English tried to keep Henry's claim to the throne going, and even had him crowned in Notre Dame at one point. But by that point, it was too late. Charles VII had managed to regain his kingdom and put an end to the Hundred Years' War going down in history as Charles the Victorious. A much better name than Charles the Mad, if you ask me. Well, it's hard to say what we should take away from Charles's story. On one hand, you could view him as a guy who really wanted to be the best king he could be, but tragically lost himself over time due to his inevitable fate. Or you could view him as a moron with literally no clue what he was doing. Yeah, probably that last thing. But either way, no matter how you view him, he's more than worth discussing. Yeah, that's probably the nicest thing you can say about him overall. But a good time's a good time. And I want to end this on a positive note. I hope you all enjoyed this little retrospective here. This has been Two Shads. Hope you enjoyed.